invite you to open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Michael leading us in the song worship so far tonight. It's already been an encouragement, and I know that uh, as we continue throughout the worship service, it'll just continue to be encouraging to us, not because we're worshiping for us, but because of who we're worshiping. Just appreciate the efforts put into this, or put into that. Uh, this is an interesting passage here in Second Timothy chapter two, and just in verse twenty, beginning. I think that this is sometimes a passage that gives us pause, and maybe for some good reason. But it says in verse twenty of Second Timothy chapter two. Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now, I think this is an interesting passage because it, it kind of clarifies some things that uh, I think sometimes people get confused on. I, I think not just Christians, but many in the religious world, many that would call themselves Christians, but uh, maybe don't know the Bible as well. When you look at this passage, it almost seems like there's a bit of a dilemma to some people. We have God who is the creator and, and who is sovereign, but who also says that we have free will. But then you look at this, and many people would say, maybe, maybe God is the one that forces you to be a vessel of honor or forces you to be a vessel of dishonor. And if that's the case, well, then the free will is out of the question. There is no choice in the matter. But what I think we find throughout all the Bible, not just in this passage, but throughout all the Bible, is that God is sovereign. He does have all the control, but at the same time, that doesn't take away the free will that his creation has. And so, while some would say that God is the one that forces you to be a vessel of honor or dishonor, the reality is, it is our choice. Now, does that mean that God is not in control if we have choice? if we are able to mess things up. And, and as I've already said so far, I think he absolutely is still in control. Sometimes I do think, though, that this is a little bit hard to balance and understand. And so I think it's helpful to look at a good example throughout the, throughout the Bible every now and then just to see what does this look like in real time. How do we make the proper application as you look at certain characters, certain individuals throughout the Bible story? And I want to do that looking at one story in particular. There's many that we could look at. You think about Pharaoh uh, during the time of the Exodus. That would be a good study in and of itself. But in 1 Kings chapter 12, if you want to turn there, 1 Kings chapter 12, there, I think this is one of the most perfect stories that illustrates this fact very clearly of how people make themselves vessels of honor or dishonor but that doesn't mean that God's not in control so in first Kings chapter 12 what you have is Solomon has has essentially brought judgment upon the kingdom of Israel because he allowed foreign wives in and as he did that idolatry came in and so God said the kingdom is going to be torn from you now not the whole kingdom there's you're going to have a portion and it's going to be a very important portion at that. But the kingdom splits in 1 Kings chapter 12. Israel, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam, I think, in all of this, play a part. Obviously, as they're a part of the story. Rehoboam being the one that's going to, Solomon's son, who's going to continue uh, leading the, the, uh, the tribe of Judah. But Jeroboam taking the rest of the kingdom, the northern kingdom, and the rest of the tribes follow after him. But all three of those groups, Israel, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam, they each make choices that either better their situation or uh, just don't help all that altogether and actually make the situation worse. Now, while each group make their own bad decisions to bring this out, God's plan is still moving forward. And, and so in, in verse 15 of chapter 12, very quickly, I just want to focus on this. With all of this going on, even though people are making decisions and you might think, well, how does God have any control in this? It says in verse 15 of First Kings chapter 12, So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word, which the Lord uh, spoke through Ahijah the Shilonite, Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And so in verse 15, we see very clearly 
that this was not just you know, the people messing up God's plans, but rather, here is something that God knew was going to happen. In fact, he planned for it, and he even puts it in his instructions to Jeroboam before he starts leading as a king of the northern kingdom. But when you think about this, a turn of events from the Lord, what exactly does this mean? Well, how, how does this affect our role in his plan? Especially when we start making decisions that are either against his will or that go along with his will. While we choose what kind of vessel we are, ultimately, though, God is in control. And I don't want to miss that point as we go throughout this study. So let's look at each group tonight and see how this kind of plays out. And first, I want to just focus on the people of Israel. And especially these people, I think, show how you make the situation worse. You can deal gracefully and you can still be on God's side even when judgment comes you just look at the instruction he gives to the people of Israel when Babylon's about to come and and what do they do they make it worse on themselves because they don't listen to him rather you and in the same way in first Kings chapter 12 I think you see something similar instead of having a humble heart instead of having a heart that is seeking God what they do is add more trouble more problems to an already bad situation as the kingdom is about to split and so in verses 1 through 4 first of all you see uh, just the attitude of the people it says Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king now when Jeroboam the son of Nebat heard of it he was living in Egypt for he was yet in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon then they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Think about the kind of attitude of this request. Your father made our yoke hard. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and then we will serve you. Now I supplied the word then because I do think that's what they're saying. He has made things hard on us. Now, if you will lighten the load, if you'll make things easier on us, then we're going to do what you want. Then we're going to serve you. But what's implied here is if you don't make it easier, well, guess what? There's going to be consequences. Now, I, I think what you have here is a spirit of rebellion in the people, especially when you think about what they've already asked for. Now, not necessarily this generation, but Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 8, they asked for a king. And you remember how Samuel tried to warn them when they asked for a king, just, just know what's coming. And know that you're going to have to submit and subject yourselves to this king. And understand what kind of work you're going to be put through. In fact, a lot of what he says goes into Solomon's reign. And so it's, it's, it's not like they didn't know what was coming. God, inspired by God, Samuel let them know, this is what you're going to have to subject yourself to. He doesn't say, this is what you're going to have to deal with and then rebel against it. He says, this is what you're going to have to submit to. Because this is what you're bringing on yourself. Now, I would just say, with all of that, this is the most prosperous time in the history of Israel. <laughs> and this may be when they are most powerful uh, throughout their entire history. Because not only did you have the successful reign of David, but right after that, Solomon is the one bringing in the rest of this prosperity. And he builds the temple made out of complete gold. And, and, and you have all of these nations, all of these kings from other nations bringing tribute to him. So this is the most powerful that they ever were in their history. And this was the most prosperous. In fact, it says that, the, that silver coins were like pebbles in the street. That's pretty rich. And so they had it pretty good. But what that does mean is that there was going to be a high standard of work and labor. What it seems like here is they just didn't want to have to do the labor anymore. I think that this is a side point, but I think that there's something to learn from that. If you want to have that kind of that kind of culture, this kind of prosperous society, guess what? There's going to be work involved, and it's not really going to stop. What they wanted, it almost seems like, is they wanted to just stop working, be lazy, and still receive all the benefits. Well, regardless, they had no right to make this demand of the king, because they're the subjects, not the other way around. They are not the ones that get to make demands, especially when you already have the instruction that had been given to them. This is what you're going to have to deal with. And, and so, now that they have this, they... They don't just get to come to the king in this way and say, this is how it's going to be. Can you imagine, parents, if, a, if your child came up to you in this way? What, in, in fact, you don't even have to imagine. What happens when your child comes up to you in that way and makes a request that sounds like, do it or else? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Who's in charge here? And in fact, the smaller they are, the easier it is to make that point clear. Who's in charge here? It's me. I can literally force you to do whatever I want. Now, 
if a child does that, they're disciplined. At least they should be. When, when people who have heard the instruction of God decide that they're going to go against and buck against his instruction, that, that's, a, that's an even worse problem. It's not just a matter of, of a momentary lapse of judgment. This is a spirit of rebellion. In fact, the text itself says that they were in rebellion for this. Look in verse 16. Skip down to verse 16. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. So it, it wasn't just the implication that makes this attitude clear. It's the fact that they, they went off of what they said they were, uh, what they were implying they were going to do the whole time. They just leave uh, the, the, they leave the authority of the king Rehoboam. Verse 17, But as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then king Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. And king Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And so not only did they say, we're not going to follow you, they actually kill one of his, one of his administers and make their point very clear. We're not, we're not doing this. Now, there are several other issues that, that end up following this. And so this is not like it's the only issue of, of rebellion in the northern kingdom of the people. But just this alone, it was rebellion. That they're going to make the, they're going to make the rules, not God. And, and or not the king that they have been put under by God. Now, all of this just to get to the main point. There already was judgment coming. God had told Solomon that the kingdom is going to be torn from you. But did Israel have to make, put themselves in this kind of light? Did they have to make themselves look worse in this situation? Or could they have been, could they have been viewed a little bit more gracefully? I think the latter. They don't have to make themselves look like this. And I think it's so much like the story of, of Jesus. Of course, the story ends with the crucifixion. Jesus was always going to die on the cross. And so th nothing was going to change that. But do you want to be J Judas in that story? Or do you want to be one of the others who are inviting and celebrating the king in when he comes into Jerusalem? I'll tell you who I'd rather be. And so... <laughs> It's so much, like that, so much like that story of Jesus. While this, of course, is going to happen, God has already promised that this is going to happen, I don't want to add to the situation. I want to make things worse by bad choices and bad actions. Well, not only that, but if this was from the Lord, you need to ask the question very clearly, does this mean that their rebellion was forced by God? Just like we were saying with that illustration, I don't think it does. While this was part of God's judgment, they made themselves vessels of dishonor. Now, how did they do that? Well, even though the judgment had come and they have to live in, this, uh, in these consequences, they make things worse by acting lawlessly. They make things worse by acting on their own wits and their own wisdom. Now, not just thinking about Judah, or not, rather, not just thinking about Judas, what about the rest of the people? that watched Jesus die, that watched Jesus while he was in Jerusalem and in that final week of his life leading up to the crucifixion. We already talked about the people that were celebrating when he comes in and praising the king, Hosanna to the son of David. But then in the very same week, there is a group of people, Israelites, Jews, who are not celebrating him entering in, but celebrating him exiting, leaving to the cross, leaving to his death. Now, once more, just like with the question of Judas, which side do you want to be on? I would rather be the side that is, in, like in Luke chapter 19, praising Jesus while he's coming in. Not the side that's saying, good, put him to death. Let his blood be on our heads. And so there's a choice that needs to be made. While, yes, judgment is coming and there are consequences that have to be lived through, that does not mean that you want to, be, you, you want to put yourself in the camp of all the rebellious people. Rather, you want to be in the camp of those that are still faithful. If God decided, when, when you think about what most of Israel did, if he decides that they were supposed to submit to Jeroboam, I think he could have done that, and they have been submissive in this. Now, how do I know that they weren't submissive? How do I know that their attitude just extends past just this moment? You go over to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 21. 
it says when he had torn Israel from the house of David, this is looking back, they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel away from following the Lord and made them commit a great sin. The sons of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel from his sight. As he spoke through all his servants, the prophets, so Israel was carried away into exile from their own land to Assyria until this day. And so they prove that they just never did care about God and his revelation. Because not only do they go after Jeroboam in a spirit of rebellion, instead of waiting to hear what God had to say and breaking up the, na and breaking up the tribes, not only that, but then they follow Jeroboam, and as he brings in more idolatry, which was the cause of this whole problem in the first place, they just give themselves over to it. And instead of looking again to God, they start going deeper and deeper into paganism, deeper and deeper into idolatry, deeper and deeper into rebellion. Uh, this past week in the south side was having a VBS and John Dryden was actually over there on Thursday night and he was talking about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3 and this kind of sparked in my mind as I was thinking through uh, some of my notes on this lesson you think about what those young men did in a bad situation Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue he builds an idol that everyone's supposed to bow down to they were subjects of Nebuchadnezzar they were subject to his rule. And in fact, God is the one that brought Israel to this point because they had rebelled so much that he says, the judgment's coming. And so Israel is in, under captivity. They're in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. They're, they're suffering the consequences. But did they have a choice in whether or not they could either assimilate into the culture around them, this idolatrous culture, or could they make the choice and say, we're not going to go that way. And with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what you find, and with Daniel even, what you find is each of them make the choice. We're suffering through some pretty bleak consequences right now. But that does not mean that I'm going to make things worse by bowing down to the idol. And in fact, because they didn't bow down to the idol, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. Now, God saves them from that. But ultimately, the point I want to make here is they had the choice to make themselves vessels of honor or dishonor even though they were already suffering from the judgment that came upon Israel. And so, with all this being said, when you look at the people of Israel in this story, they could have played a different, a brighter role in God's plan. Instead of giving an ultimatum to, truly, the Lord's anointed, which is what the king was, they could have humbly petitioned him. Instead of giving in to Jeroboam's idolatry, they could have remained steadfast to God. They made themselves vessels of dishonor in God's plan by adding to the problem instead of keeping him and holding fast to him in all their ways. Now, that's Israel's side of things. Looking at Rehoboam, Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son, coming back to 1 Kings chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12, following on in the story. I think the main issue with Rehoboam was that we know that he seeks counsel, but ultimately, what he does not do is seek counsel from God. Look in verse 5 of uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. It says, Then he said to them, Depart for three days, then return to me. So the people departed. King Rehoboam consulted with the, with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you counsel me to answer this people? Then they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to this people today and will serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him and con consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he said to them, What counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? The young men who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, This you shall say to this people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made your, our yoke heavy. Now you make it lighter for us, but you shall speak to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins." Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. And then it just continues on with the story. But that's where the, the seeking advisement, seeking counsel stops. So he asked the elders that served with Solomon. He asked the young men around his age that grew up with him. Who's left off of that list? Well, God. 
And this is not to say that we shouldn't seek the counsel of, of the wisdom around us. But if we are seeking for counsel, seeking for wisdom, and we leave God off of that list, in fact, if we don't start with him and end with him, we're doing something wrong. What we're doing is, like Rehoboam, neglecting God by neglecting his wisdom and neglecting his counsel in all of our ways. Now, I do think that there's something about this story. There, we need, I think there is a good application to make that it's better to listen to the advice of those that are older than us than those that are our age or younger. Just understand, regardless of which advice he took, what God promised Solomon was going to happen was still going to happen. Even if he took, and in fact, I don't even know if the elders' advice is all that good because the people come in a rebellious way with an ultimatum. And what the older men say is, well, maybe let's just kind of give in to that. And I don't know if even that's, if that's a good advice. But regardless, whatever he did, the judgment was still going to come. Remember, in verse 15, this was a turn of events from the Lord. In fact, go over to 1 Kings chapter 11, just a chapter prior. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 31 or, or verse 11, rather, it says, So the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. So that's what he tells Solomon. Look over at what he tells Jeroboam in verse 31. He said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you to the ten tribes. But he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon. And they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight and observing my statutes and my ordinances as his father David did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I choose, who observed who I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes, but I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give it to you, even ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. I will take you and you shall reign over whatever you desire and you shall be king over Israel. So it's pretty clear what God is going to do. What God has said surely will come to pass. But then look at verse 38. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David and I will give Israel to you. Now, from Solomon to Jeroboam, God makes it very clear what is coming. Now, though it's true that no matter what advice Rehoboam took, this was going to happen. But this does not nullify the need to receive God's counsel at all times. Over in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21. Proverbs 19 and verse 21. It says, many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. What does that mean? Man can think of all kinds of things. We can think of all many different sorts of paths, like we were talking about this morning. But there's only one path that's going to be victorious, that's going to work, and that's God's. And so if we... Even should we seek counsel from hundreds of wise men of this age, it will not be able to succeed against the counsel and the plan of God. And so we need to be careful that just because, just like Rehoboam, just because this judgment was coming, that does not mean that there was no responsibility to look for God. In fact, I think it would have made things easier on him had he done so. In Isaiah chapter 30, in verse 1, as He's speaking about this judgment that's going to come on Israel years down the road. He says, Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine, and make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame, and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. And so what were they trying to do? They were trying to escape judgment. They were trying to escape the judgment that God said was coming. They could have found some level of escape through God, as you see with the faithful remnant that God preserves, even into the captivity. You know, it's not like everybody dies. It's not like there's an extermination across the board. He kept those that were faithful to him. And so it's not like he couldn't do it, but what did these people decide to do? Instead of trusting him, instead of going with his plan, they decide, let's go back to Egypt. And it's because they took their plans over God's, that's why God's going to find them out. And he is going to specifically root them out and destroy them. 
And so what we do when we don't seek God's counsel and his wisdom, but rather everyone else's, we worsen the consequences on ourselves. And I think that's what Rehoboam did. Just like the people of Israel, he could have been shown in a brighter and a better light in this story. So how should we respond then? I think like Hezekiah in Isaiah chapter 37. He was in the midst of judgment coming against Judah. But what happens? He comes to God, and I think it's because of his faithfulness, his faithful leadership, that God says, all right, not yet. We're going to extend this a little bit longer. And so we need to be more like Hezekiah, maybe less like Rehoboam, seeking God at all times. Now, he did not seek God's counsel. But perhaps the only good part of this story is when he finally listens to God. Over in chapter 12 again of 1 Kings in verse 21. Chapter 12 and verse 21. Now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. What was he going to do? He was going to start this civil war because they had seceded from the kingdom. These are my subjects. I'm going to get them back. But in verse 22, the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah, and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You must not go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing has come from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and returned and went their way according to the word of the Lord. Now, if you read that and think, Well, what utter defeat for Rehoboam. You read wrong. Maybe there is some level of defeat because, yes, he doesn't have all of the tribes that he wants. In fact, most of the tribes are gone from his reign. They're cut off from him. But regardless, how this verse ends in verse 24, that couldn't be a better way to end that side of the story. That they did according to the word of the Lord. Again, which side do you want to be on? What do you think would have happened had they heard the word of the Lord and then decided we're still going to go further? We're going to go further in this and we're going to start this war. I think they would have lost. They would have just lost more lives, more morale, and they would have made the situation that much more worse on themselves. And so God's counsel, it didn't take away the consequences of Israel being torn, but it did prevent the worse consequences from befalling them. And I think that there's, there's all kinds of applications we can make to that. So you just think of the man who is put away for adultery. Maybe that man, he, he tries to repent, and, and he even does repent. He makes that confession. He acknowledges his sin before all of those that, that, need, to be, that need to be told, before all those that needs to be confessed to. He's listening to God's commands in this. And so he's right with God. But just because he comes and makes himself right with God, that does not mean that the consequences, all of the consequences will be taken away. Just because he comes before God and says, I repent, I shouldn't have done this. That doesn't mean that the wife doesn't get to put him away. That doesn't mean he gets to say, all right, we get to be married again. No, you've made some choices that you're going to have to live with. But that does not mean that you can't be right with God or make yourself right with God again. And so all the while... While we have to live through certain judgment, certain consequences, we can still have a chance to make ourselves vessels of honor or vessels of dishonor. Even when we don't necessarily see the escape from the judgment, whether it's on us or around us, we can be on his side and the Lord knows who are his. Now, we're going to have to be willing to endure the judgment around us while continually seeking God and understanding that this won't just take the previous consequences away. We have to submit to him. And if we don't submit to him, just like what we see with the Israelites, I think we just bring more consequences on ourselves and make the situation worse. Well, finally, looking at Jeroboam. Jeroboam's side of things, it it doesn't get much better. It doesn't necessarily say the same. In fact, I think it gets a little bit worse because instead of neglecting God's counsel from the beginning, what he does is reject God's guidance, I think, just carte blanche. In 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 38, we already read what God said to Jeroboam. If you follow me, if you do my commandments, you will be successful. But, but what does that condition mean? If you don't, guess what's going to happen? But condemnation. And so Jeroboam could have fulfilled his role in a way that was pleasing to God. God makes that very clear. Had God put Jeroboam in a situation where the only path he could take was a sinful one, 
We know that Jeroboam is going to be inviting even more idolatry in. But does that mean that God's at fault for this? What does James chapter 1 and verse 13 say? But let no man say that when they face temptation, God is the one tempting me. That God is at fault for, for, for the sin that I'm about to commit or that the sin I am committing currently. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. But God is faithful. There is no temptation that has overtaken you. That, that There's not a way of escape. We have a chance. We have a choice in all of these things. And God has made clear that, that, that we can be successful. What it comes down to is we decide to reject him. We decide to throw away his guidance completely. So someone may look at this story and say, God put Jeroboam in an impossible situation. He had no way to reign rightly. He had no way to do this in, in a way that would glorify God. I, just, I don't understand how you can say that when reading the instruction God himself gives to Jeroboam. Just because Jeroboam goes off the deep end, that doesn't mean he didn't have the chance to do the right thing. So while, and you can even see this throughout all of the Bible, when David is anointed king and Saul decides that he is going to be a poor king and start trying to kill David, David doesn't go too far. In fact, what he does is say, I'm not going to put my hand against the Lord's anointed, against Saul, even though Saul is persecuting him. David does it rightly. David humbly glorifies God in his behavior, through his behavior, even though his, his journey was long, difficult, and arduous. He, didn't, he was exiled from his own home. But even throughout all of that, not only did he suffer all of that, during that time he accrued territory and power for God and his people. I mean, this is how we do it rightly. Maybe it's going to be hard. Maybe we do have to suffer a little bit. But we can definitely make choices that glorify God and, and bring us in his sight as those like David that have a heart for him. Now, was Jeroboam in an impossible situation where God forced him to sin? Absolutely not. In fact, God had given him more than enough to succeed. So Jeroboam's failure is completely on him. Not on God, on him. Because he rejected God completely. In verse 25 of chapter 12, it says, Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves, and he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that, behold, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He sent one in Bethel, and in the, in the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people went for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan and he made houses on high places and made priests from among all the people who are not the sons of Levi and you could go on into chapter 13 even and you see just how awful things got not only did he make these idolatrous uh, uh, statues that they were to bow down to even attribute characteristics of God to but he even he even starts bringing in harlots as the priests he starts bringing in the, the sexual temptation into the worship, into the idolatrous worship. How much further from God could you get? Now, Jeroboam, was he forced to do that by God? No. Jeroboam could have had really guaranteed success. But he didn't because he did not listen to God. We look at this and maybe we think, how could he be so foolish? How could he have gotten all of those instructions from God? How could he have heard all of that and still messed up? I think it's maybe more easy than we think, maybe more subtle than we think. This happens all the time with Christians. We, we, we read over and over and over again the, the, the commandments that God has given us in the New Testament church. When it comes to church discipline, he te, he's very clear about what we're to do. When it comes to the unrepentant brother, what does he say? Do not associate with them. And so he is very clear about this, but then what happens? You have some Christians that say, well, you know, I, I just don't know about this. You have some Christians that aren't withdrawing properly, and then when, when those people that are, are sinning aren't coming back, aren't trying to make their lives right, they sit there and ask, ask themselves, how could this not be working? Well, the reason it's not working is because you're not heeding his counsel. You're not actually withdrawing. You're not really taking that association away. You're acting like you are. When it comes to evangelism, 
We, we read all of the verses about making sure that we're trying to bring people in. We read about the first century church all throughout Acts and how evangelistic they were. And instead of doing exactly as they did, being as zealous in that and being as, as, as opportunistic as they were, instead we kind of hang back. We don't evangelize like, like they do. And then we look around and we say, why is the church dying? What's going on? Why does it seem that the church is beginning to limp and beginning to become weak? Well, it's because we're not doing what keeps a congregation alive. Instead of really engaging in evangelism, the way we see it, instead of heeding God's commandments, what have we done? we've rejected them. Now, you, you may say, well, we, we did kind of do it. No, it's either you obey or you have disobeyed. There's no partial obedience here. And so the question remains, did God set Jeroboam up for failure? Does God set us up for failure when he gives us commandments? And maybe we just don't do them. And we, we just fail utterly when we come up to those commandments. I think as, as hopefully has been made clear throughout this study this evening, God is not the one who's at fault here. But it's those who decide that they're going to come up with their own path instead of taking God's. In chapter 14 in verse 7 of 1 Kings, it says, Go say to Jeroboam, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, yet you have, been like my ser you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free in Israel, and I will make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And he who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens will eat, for the Lord has spoken it. Now you arise, go to your house. Where, when your feet enter the city, the child will die. Now, Jeroboam was expecting that maybe God was going to give some mercy. What God says very emphatically is, no. And it's not because Jeroboam was, was, was betrayed by God. It's not because Jeroboam was tricked or deceived by God. It's because God gave him everything he needed to succeed and to do right and to do well and to be blessed. And he bucked and he threw it all away. And so God says, no, the, Jer the judgment's not going to be taken away. In fact, it's going to be even worse on you. Jeroboam is condemned by God not because he is inherently sinful that God made him to be that way, but because he made himself that way. Like Pharaoh, he made his heart stubborn. So what do we learn from all of this? You go back to 2 Timothy very quickly in chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21, as it talks about the vessels of honor and dishonor. I, uh, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, rather. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. When he says, if anyone cleanses himself, what do you think that means? What does that sound like? Does it sound like uh, this is set in stone? No. It sounds like God has given you and me a chance. A chance to obey him or to disobey him. And there's no in between. And there's no... I kind of did what you said. It's either I've done what he said or I haven't. And so if you're a Christian, maybe you have been living in such a way that shows a, a little bit of partial obedience. Understand, that's, that's full out disobedience. And it's just a subtle version of a spirit of rebellion. And you don't have to keep living that way. If you recognize that, you can make your life right with God this very night, this very evening before you leave because you have an advocate in heaven. If you are not a Christian, I would say emphasizing what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you cleanse yourself, you can be prepared for every good work. God is the one who prepares though. So how has he prepared us to become Christians? He's given us conditions to follow. How do you cleanse yourself? You have to be baptized and wash away your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Put that old man away to rise in newness of life and live not like Rehoboam who didn't seek his counsel. Not like Jeroboam who just didn't care at all about God's guidance. Not like Israel who gives an ultimatum but says, I am yours and whatever you say, I will do. Are you willing, do you have that attitude 
Are you willing to submit to God in that kind of way? If you are, if you're subject to the invitation of Christ by any means, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.